Welcome to Calvary Conversations. My name is Mariah, and I'm here with my dad, Pastor Craig Roders. What's up? Today we have a very special guest who is a singer, songwriter, and he was the one who pioneered contemporary Christian music. He also is a co-founder of Love Song, and he was with Calvary and Vineyard. He knows Pastor Chuck Smith, Lonnie Frisbee, Keith Green, and so we're excited to go through his testimony today. He also has a book. He's an author for Rock and Roll Preacher. So here is our part one conversation with Chuck Gerard. Chuck, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. I've been looking forward to this. Well, my mom has been excited for this for a long time. She grew up listening to your music, and she's here today. So she's in the other Hi, room. Mom. But she said hello. <laughs> yeah. um, but she's kind of fangirling right now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but my dad, he also is inspired by you yeah. and everything. So we're excited to hear testimony. But before we get started... We'll have my dad pray for us. Let's so. pray. Sure. Father God, we just thank you so much for this time with Chuck. We just pray that you'd bless it, that you would guide us, Lord. You would just, as you say, you control the king's heart like a water, water course. Control our minds. Just uh, lead us to speak on what you want us to speak on. Help us not to be afraid to touch the issues we talked off camera about the Holy Spirit and what uh, really yeah. blessed Calvary and what will bless all churches. And so, Lord, we just want all of you, Lord. We don't want to go beyond you with charismaniac, but we also don't want to be Baptist. We want to just be what you want us to be. So Lord, thank you for people like Chuck who just saw the, 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 such an incredible outpouring of your spirit, such a miraculous thing. And we just know that you do things, all things are new. You do the things different as you saying off camera, that you're not going to redo the Jesus movement, but you're going to do something different. Mm -hmm. And so God, we have to, you say, earnestly desire that we need to desire the gifts to flow. We need to pray for that. And so father, I pray that he would be able to maybe to help us unpack that and how to do that decently in order. So father, God, uh, bless this time and thank you for his life and thank you for what you've done through him and love song and just bless him and bless his book Lord that, that it will mm, get out there to really so. encourage people who don't know you or maybe people that have known you but kind of fallen away to come back to you and so we just thank you for this time we commit it to you in the mighty name of Jesus amen amen, amen. all right so we're gonna just start off by you sharing um, where you were born and what your upbringing and childhood was like growing up. Sure. Well, I'm an L.A. boy. I was <laughs> born in downtown L.A. at a hospital called the French Hospital, and I was raised most of my life, in well, all of my life in California up until I you know, moved to Tennessee 16 years ago. But um, so I'm a, I'm a true Angelino, <laughs> and uh, I was raised in a, uh, you know, legalistic nominal, back, nominal Christian background for me, at least. I mean, mm. It's, let's just say it's Catholic, okay? Yeah. Uh, but Catholic uh, didn't really work for me. And um, uh, I, I, when I was a start, about 15, 16, I started getting interest, interested in music. And uh, one of the doctrines in the church was, at that time, they, they rescinded it later. But uh, if you ate meat on Friday, it was a mortal yeah. sin and you'd it's go to Friday, hell. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, hey, if I'm going to hell for eating meat, I'm going to go get some chicks and I'm going to find yeah. some whiskey because yeah, I'm not going to hell. For, you know, if I'm going to spend my life in hell, I'm going to make it worthwhile. Yeah. And that was a real attitude. That was really, and it kind of put me off on a path of, you know, drinking and the whole thing. And then, of course, I got into the music thing. I had a, a hit on the Billboard charts when I was, I was uh, in senior in high school. And that was kind of all she wrote. That was just enough of a taste of success for me to... Uh, want to make this my life's work. I always loved rock and roll music. I mean, I, I started out before it was rock and roll. It was doo-wop, you know, <laughs> the, the first music. And then Elvis came along, and I loved all of that stuff. It was just such a exciting new music for me. And I knew I couldn't be Elvis, but I knew I wanted to be part of that whole thing. So I put a little group together in high school. We got a record contract, and as I say, we had a couple of hits in uh, 1961 and two. The group was called The Castells, if you want to Google it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the songs were sacred, and so this is love. And uh, then I met a guy named Gary Usher who had co-written some songs with the Beach Boys. We met through Sock Hops. If, mm -hmm. I don't know if you're young, old enough to remember that, but I, you'd I have didn't a. I go to, but I remember hearing about him. Yeah. It was a concert, yeah. but it was all lip sync. You know, and there were no live musicians there. Just the, the singers would come, and then they'd lip sync their. They had play a track and lip sync their song, or even not play a track. They just lip sync the actual vocal on the record. And Gary had a little group that had a hit, hit that was beginning to take catch catch on in L.A. called uh, RPM by the Four Speeds. 
gotta get i gotta get i gotta get my rpms <laughs> so uh we're still there we're in the same little sock hop and he's talking to me he says you know i'm doing a lot of uh, music in the studios you want to come and make some extra money and be a studio singer so i did that for about four years and uh we put out one record that more people remember uh, called little honda by the hondells it was uh first gear it's all yeah. right oh yeah <laughs> i love that song yeah i was Second the lead vocal kind of tight yeah I that. yeah yeah hang on tight yeah. and uh so uh that was how i spent the you know preceding my my foray into hippieville i was you know my my parents were and grandparents were were my father died when i was four so we went and moved in and lived with my grandparents and they like i say they were i like to say nominal catholics i don't know if they were or not you know i don't judge that stuff but i was too young to even determine that but um for me it was very legalistic and i didn't enjoy it so i like i say i went off to a life of music and then uh, that transitioned into uh me connecting with the hippie movement and then that part of the story so that's that's kind of the beginnings you know i I had a lot of great experiences one of the one of the clients we had was a young 13 year old kid Mm -hmm. that was a real genius piano player and he'd written some songs and i was in the doo-wop group in the background and uh we we didn't um, know who he was going to become but that happened to be keith green so that was one of the the starts there and there's so a lot of i worked with the musicians that we call the wrecking crew now uh that made all the records in la that became legendary i had leon russell and glenn campbell both work on my records before they were famous so it was an exciting time i was a fan i loved that music i thought every i went to a little jukebox place where i could get the records for 10 cents a piece they all looked the a side was all white from the plays and the b side was pristine (laughs) You know, yeah, 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 and I, so here I am on stage with people like Jerry Lee Lewis and Jackie Wilson, and it, you know it was like just rub my eyes. So that was the, that was my beginning in the music and wow. transition and into the hippie thing. And then what what did it look like for your transition to Christ? Because were you at like a, a low point in your life, and were you broken? And then how did you like hear about Calvary, and what did all of that yeah. look like for you? Sure. Well, you know it's interesting. Even in my alcohol testimony, which is later um people think you know you were desperate or lonely or sad i just like being high to be Mm -hmm. honest about it you know so uh i got curious Uh, i was i was i was a pretty straight guy other than being a musician and i was alcoholic at Mm -hmm. that time i was i started drinking when i was 15 but otherwise i'm pretty straight laced and all of a sudden i saw pictures of these kids growing their hair long and looking like jesus and smoking dope and uh, one picture that really impacted me was that it was in the chronicle or something in san francisco or maybe it was one of those life look magazines he's looking into a light bulb as if he's seeing the universe and what's going on with these people (laughs) so i got more interested in that you know drugs beyond uh alcohol and i people don't realize this but in my day the drug scene was not really open in the music scene you know people did all that stuff but they didn't you know people weren't getting stoned in the studio or if they were they didn't talk about it so uh i did not have easy access to drugs but somehow i got a hold of a joint and i smoked my first joint and then for a year i just tried to find all the marijuana i could and then eventually we we uh, i formed a group that we were playing in las vegas in one of the uh, rock and roll clubs they're called the pussy (laughs) catagogo and uh there was there was a, a, a band there called Mirror of Karma, right? Wow. And there was a guy in there that was a dead ringer for George Harrison, and they were all hippied out, and they, but they were in LSD. So they gave me a, 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 a cap of LSD, and I had my first LSD trip, and it was all of a sudden I thought, now I know what that guy was about looking into the light bulb, you know? So that began my, my, um, my transition. I, I became less interested in music, but it was always about God, even for, you know, I didn't, I didn't know God at that point, but it felt like this is a connection to, um, to spirituality. Mm. And it was counterfeit, but it was also very real in its own way. And, but I always saw it as a connection to the afterlife. From that point on, I never doubted if there was an afterlife. I knew that there was something going on after we die. And um, so I, I was, I'm always a curious kind of guy, and I thought, I've got to find out what's going on with God, because if, if, the, if the Catholics are right and I'm going to hell, I don't even know if there is a hell, but if there is one, I don't want to go there. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I, I, made a, you know, I made this kind of commitment to, to search this out. 
And um, the Bible was a part of it. And eventually, when I met Jay Truax, we had been been playing in Vegas with Mirror of Karma, but every now and then the band would change. And a band came through in Vegas called the Fifth Cavalry. And one of the members of the Fifth Cavalry was a guy named Denny Carell. Do you know who I'm talking about? I've heard of Denny Carell, yeah. A really well, uh, in those days, one of the greatest singers on the planet. He's yeah. gone to be with the Lord about 20 years ago. But Denny was a great singer, and he was turned on for Jesus. Now, he was still taking drugs, but he was evangelistic, and he'd get us on our breaks. He'd say, you need to receive Jesus. And I think once I did it, just to get him to shut up, and it wasn't <laughs> yeah, real. But, um, just to get my friends to be quiet, yeah. So they were coming back to Orange County to play in a club that one of the members, his father, had started a club called Gold Street. And we went down there when we got back to hang out because we, we idolized their band. They were so cool. A guy named Virgil Beckham was a part of that, too. His son was recently on, uh, he, he was second place on one of the uh, American Idols, uh, Clark, Clark Beckham. So um, we'd just sit and watch the, the cavalry night after night and go down there. It wasn't an alcohol club, but we'd just go down there and we'd get stoned and we'd watch the groups. And uh, they eventually broke up and I snagged Denny and we put a band together and we played there. And uh, that began, the, it was kind of, a, it, we didn't call it love song, but it was the first version of love song. Mm -hmm. And we began to play in nightclubs and we were evangelistic. Uh, you know, we thought, well, here's what I thought. I thought that drugs were a gift from God, especially LSD. Not so. I never play. I was never took heroin. Mm -hmm. I had very little experimentation with anything other than what psychedelic drugs. And I thought that they were a gift from God. That if you were brave enough to take drugs, then it would open up this yeah. whole new side, the, the spiritual side. So we were trying to get people just to turn on to drugs, just as much as finding God. Mm. We actually take people out you know, to little parks and things on weekends, and we'd preach, and it was, I mean, we were into it, you know, but we weren't Christians yet. So uh, we started getting busted, hmm. and there was a raid on a club one night, and I went, uh, I got arrested. They, they said it was heroin later on. They realized it was LSD, but I spent one day in Orange County Jail because there were so many hippies getting busted that hmm. they didn't have jail Fair space. <laughs> but it was enough to make me not want to go back to jail. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I went, we were going to Vegas one time and we got busted with some uh, hashish and got our heads all shaved and stuff they weren't supposed to do, but we didn't know our rights in those days. Mm -hmm. And so now, by the time now that I'm seeking really, we lived in Laguna Beach at that time. And we had this really nice house in South Laguna overlooking the beach and, uh, it should have been the great time of our life, mm -hmm. about eight of us living up there communally. I don't even know how we managed to rent. It was an upscale house. Mm -hmm. and uh, But we were miserable, you know, because we're, we're facing these. I had to go back to court in six months, and we're kind of going, what's going on in our lives? And then we start to hear about Calvary Chapel. Mm -hmm. Now, we used to pick hippies up along the Pacific Coast Highway to get free drugs. You know, they <laughs> you'd pick somebody up, and they'd have a bag of weed, and they say, you want a joint? But now we're picking up kids and they're saying, hey, do you know Jesus? We found <laughs> Jesus. And we go, well, we're looking for him. Where'd you find him? Yeah. And it was always Calvary Chapel. Mm. Oh, wow. So one night, I'm trying to wind up the story here, but one night uh, we, we, we used to have these stone Bible studies up at the uh, Laguna House. And uh, we'd read the Bible. We'd drop drugs and read the Bible. And one night we're having this controversy over tongues. And uh, can you imagine that the controversy? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, not today. it's all settled now, right? <laughs> right. And I couldn't believe tongues was in the Bible because I used to take my guitar up. There was a little hill up the up the road a bit, and you could sit under a tree and look at the ocean and play your guitar, play your music. And I used to go into a, what I call free form singing, and I just play chords and I'd start. Uh, it was speaking in tongues, but I didn't know it wasn't under the unction. It was just making stuff up. Because it was free. You didn't have to think about a lyric. you just make up sounds. Well, it would call darkness. And I'd sit there and I'd go, oh, this is creepy. What's going on here? And I'd put the guitar down and go in the house. It happened a couple times. So when I find this, when we're discussing this doctrine in the Bible, I thought, what's this doing in the Bible? And I told the guys, you know, I don't think this is of God, but it's in the Bible. So there's some hippies down the road where it was Lonnie Frisbee was. And uh, they had got take uh, Calvary had there was a motel in escrow and they had allowed the hippies. There was a long escrow and they said, you guys can live there till the place sells. It's called the Blue Top. And Lonnie was the it was became a Christian house and Lonnie was the head of the Christian house. So we said, well, we'll get on there and talk to these hippies that are more Christians than we are because they're, you know, they're going to 
church and stuff, and we're not. So we went down there, and we, you know, knocked on the door, and uh, I can just imagine it was about 7 o'clock. Maybe they just finished dinner, probably praying and going, Lord, please send us other hippies that are lost so we can preach the gospel. And all of a sudden, they opened the door, and there's five stone guys with the Bible saying, can you tell us what tongues is about? <laughs> Well, they loved on us, and they, we I don't remember ever discussing tongues after that in, in that meeting, but uh, they invited us up to church, and that's when I first went up to church was at their at their uh, invitation. That's cool. Wow. Hey, Chuck, yeah. can I ask you this? Because I hear this because Lonnie was the same way. He used to drop acid and read his mm-hmm. Bible, go up to some falls, I forget, where he'd go hang out. So it's mm-hmm. like, Talk- when it, how did you guys learn, like, okay, you probably should – Ixnay on the drugs and yet pursue Jesus. I mean, where, where, how did that, is that when you got saved or when did you go, oh, wait, yeah. drugs and Jesus probably are not a good mix? That began early, uh, okay. earlier than we, when we were converted because our, at, the, at this point, we thought, you know, we should be able to have this high, this great feeling about life without drugs. Mm-hmm. And we, were, we knew that was a goal. Yeah. So, but we didn't understand how to get there, you know, and, uh, I, I had had a bad experience with LSD. We lived in Salt Lake City for a while, and I had a bad experience with LSD, so I quit that, but I was still smoking hashish and, and uh, weed. But it was miserable, and it wasn't fun anymore, you know. And so we wanted, we definitely wanted to get out of that, and um, eventually, of course, when we became Christians. But it was always on the agenda that there had to be something higher that would be so satisfying we wouldn't need drugs. Yeah. That's, how, we were that's, right. that's yeah. how I got, yeah, I got saved on LSD. Where I was ready, I'm just hearing voices, kill yourself, mm. you know, nobody cares about you, you know, and I didn't know demonic stuff, so I just thought, I'm losing it, I'm getting scared. So I'm like, had a gun to my head, and all of a sudden, God's like, I hear God's voice saying, Craig, where are you going? And I was raised Catholic, but I'd thrown all that out, I thought I'd reincarnate something else, so it wasn't any fear of blowing my head off, mm. and then all of a sudden, God just said that simple thing where are you going? I went, mm. oh my goodness, I go from hell on earth to hell. Mm. And I mean, I dropped the gun and then this old girlfriend called me up and the rest is history. But uh, right. yeah, so I mean, people forget to say that. They always talk about how awesome, you know, hallucinogenics and mushrooms are, but all it takes is a bad trip. And now they're saying, have you heard this check? They're saying for schizophrenics mm. to give them LSD. Mm. They're saying that my uncle, who's a, who's a, 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 he's got a master's degree in counseling, and he's saying that they're wanting to prescribe LSD to people. I'm going, man, I watch one of my best friends lay out in the mist, in the street in the, on LSD and get ran over by a car, you know. And so, yeah. you know, I'm thinking, how is that going to be a good day? I, I mean, no, you know. So. Well, back before it was illegal, that was the use of it. In fact, Cary Grant, the actor, was uh, under LSD um, uh, m- 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 therapy. Uh, so they thought it was a drug that could be applied to those type of things. So I'm not surprised they're back to it. Wow. <laughs> and then you also said that it was one of the Beatles who got saved, right? And then you heard who was Oh, that? it was uh, not Beatles. It was, um, Beatles. What, it was really cool. On my, you'll, you'll love this and how oh. powerful music is. But I was, um, so I got saved, and it was kind of like all my friends said, praying for me, just receive Christ, you know, hippies, just come on, come on, come on. And I'm like, oh, come on. I'm like, I'm too far gone, man. And so I just said, all right, pray the prayer. But I did just to get him to shut up, you know, I just said, pray the prayer. And I felt nothing. Mm. There was no, I didn't feel a thing. I didn't really beat it. And all of a sudden, I go back home to my house, and I used to give weed because I had a friend who grew it in Oregon. So I just, we could, I'd give all my weed away, you know, smoke whatever you want. Mm-hmm. But cocaine, I sold cocaine, and I, was, I wouldn't give that away without some price. But um, so I go to my house, and everyone, and I, this is an old girlfriend, so I'm going to hear the gospel to hook up with this old girlfriend. So it has nothing mm-hmm. to do with Jesus, right? You imagine that. And all of a sudden, I just go, I don't want to get high anymore. I don't want to get high anymore. And my friends are like, oh, Rhoda, you're so funny. You're, you're such a crazy man. you know." And I go, seriously, I don't. And I was like, who is talking? I didn't <laughs> even know. And then so they their thing was, I don't know if you experienced it. They were like, oh, we're getting you back to drugs. You are not going to be this Jesus freak. And they, had a, they were Catholics, and they said how their dad was a hypocrite. Anyway, so um, all of a sudden they – they go and they take and they had red hair sesame, ses, uh, red hair sesame and this really good stuff and they put it in a big old peace pipe and they bring it around and all of a sudden I'm like nope no one get high and all of a sudden my hand goes yep I do and I just grabbed it and I got high and I go I can't even do Jesus right mm-hmm. I'm gonna blow my head I'm this is the night after I'd almost blow my head off and I go I'm gonna do it mm-hmm. this time Jesus mm-hmm. didn't work for me it's I mm-hmm. I'm it's a joke but anyway so as soon as I said that. It was up in or- uh, Portland, has a K-Gun, but it had a uh, rock block at 3 in the morning. And all of a sudden, Joe English, 
you know, Joe English from, uh, you know, he was the sure. Paul McCartney. He goes, I've had sex, I had women, I've had drugs, I've had everything, but Jesus is the answer, man. And all of a sudden I go, see, man, you can't be a Christian and still be cool. And I ran home, you know, mm-hmm. had so much resin in my lungs, I could barely run, but I'm running home. And I said, and I gave my life to Jesus. I just ran, mm-hmm. I kneeled down in the same chair, I almost blew my head off. Yeah. And I said, Jesus, you know, I hate my life, I've ruined it, but yeah. if you can do something with it, it's yours. And Damn, Amen. changed my life. Amen. So. Praise yeah. God. And this is about you. I'm sorry. I don't yeah, mean yeah. No, I, was, I want. To, but the other question I wanted to ask you is, what was it like when you went to Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, and what was it like meeting Chuck, and then how did you get involved in like the worship team and love song and all that? Yeah. Stuff? Well, I was never on the worship team. Okay. Uh, we just played there as sort of the house okay. band, but. Um, I went up, the guys had gone up together. I didn't go with them. And they had first experienced it before I did. And But I knew, I, I was kind of down on anything Christian because of my background. Mm. But I thought, you know, uh, this sounds really good, and I need to check it out. And if I'm going to be an open-minded seeker, then I have to go try it. So mm. I drove up alone one night. And um, Calvary in those days was in a, like a big vineyard. You know, it was, it was almost a little country church if we could have that in Santa Ana, California. Yeah, exactly. And it was about a mile around the block, and I drove around once. I came, you know, and I tried. I first I drove up, and I thought, no, I can't go in. I can't go in. I drive around, and it happened about three times. And finally, I said, it's now or never. You got to go in. So I parked the car. I went in. I sat on the back seat. I got a, a seat where I could get out easily if I wanted to escape. (laughs) And um, to to tell you the truth, the 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 first thing that impacted me was the music now i was a kind of a musical snob i like pink floyd and yeah. prog rock and musical stuff and these were just kids that you know they didn't have really much musical talent and they'd tell us when they were going to play a song the lord gave them last night and they'd pick up a a six string guitar with five strings on it and out of tune and <laughs> couldn't sing but i was deeply moved and i'm going like why is this stirring me so much mm. it's not even very good but it's <laughs> wow touching my heart i didn't call it touching my heart i didn't know any of those terms but it was like deeply moving me so then chuck was the preacher then i came that night i came to see lonnie but chuck was preaching a little disappointed i don't remember the message what i remember is this the holy spirit began to speak to me at that point uh based on a lot of hippie ideas from the music the beatles and stuff i'll just use one for example the song that's uh i'm in you and you're in me and we are all together who mm-hmm. good you right? and i thought my philosophy was this cosmic universe oneness that yeah. no man could be at peace till all men were at peace so very i kind of carried yeah very carried this kind of burden right yeah. that man i got to get my act together but we got to get everybody else to get because we're all evangelistic even mm-hmm. if we were wrong so uh, that night, God kind of turned that all around. He said, you need to get yourself right. I didn't know it was God. You know, the, you identify all this later, but it was just the whole thing was happening, and it was very emotional. And I realized, hey, I have to get myself right. Mm. And this burden lifted off me. That's mm, what happened. It was God. almost a, a physical cloak came off me that it, it just felt free. And I was laughing. I mm. was weeping. Mm. I probably had snot all over my beard. <laughs> That's cool. It's just, but it was complete abandon, and I didn't go to the altar call that night. But I said this to God: I said, if this feels like you, this feels right. So here's my commitment: I'll be here till you tell me different. If this is just a stepping stone, <coughs> excuse me. If this is just a stepping stone to something higher, then you can show me that. And that was nearly 50 years ago now. So, well, over 50 cool. years. So. Yeah, yeah I'm, so I'm, I'm 11 that. years, so I'm 39 years, so the same thing. And that's what's so cool. Uh, we were talking off camera. Well, I guess we're going to show it. But what's really cool, too, Chuck, I don't, that's what I went to the Calvary or Grace Chapel, which is kind of like Chuck said, it was the same outpouring mm-hmm. at the same time, pretty much. It didn't spread. It happened simultaneously. But what I loved is, so I went there to disprove tongues, disprove the gifts, the gifts. I was a cessationist. It's not for today. And this band i mean it wasn't even that cool mm. i mean it wasn't like you know like um like uh, bethel or anything it wasn't like incredible rock and roll it was just kind of like all right and i mean i could have been critical but as soon as i'm kind of looking at it going nah, you know look at these charismaniacs mm. all of a sudden the holy spirit just touched me like you and i just started weeping 
And I'm going, what is going on? And to me as a Baptist, I was a closet worshiper, but I thought worship was just for women. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of came in at the end, you know, to get the word. (laughs) You're touching some great points there. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. And so, but like we were talking about what do we need to get, but it really was the anointing because I've gone to a lot of these incredible bands that are like really top Christian bands now. I don't want to mention, well, Bethel type stuff. And you sense amazing music. But it's not the same off. anointing yeah. of where you just are broken. I mean, you're moved emotionally, right? which Elton John out. can do that. The Beatles could do that, you know. But where there's just anointing where it's unexplainable, where you just go, I am undone. This is crazy. And that's where, as a bap, even though I was saved, I was resistant. You know, everyone right. says the charismatic, you got to be open. Op- I wasn't open, and God yet rocked my world. And then this mm-hmm. pastor who was, you know, kind of like Chuck, he wasn't very sexy, just an old guy. A suit, and he just gets up there, and I'm like, man, there's Baptist pastors more charismatic <laughs> than this. And then as soon as he said that, like a rhema word hit me, and I'm going, what was that? And that's what we need, I think, again, is truly the anointing, mm-hmm. right, on our simple works, because we're trying to be sexy and light and smoke. You know, <laughs> you see, I always say laugh at the smoke guy, you know, he's doing yeah, smoke yeah. at the church. And I'm worshiping, even at Calvary, I'm worshiping in the front row because there's packed, and there's a camera right two feet, two inches from my face. I'm like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Like a, a handheld, and I'm going, my goodness, and I'm seeing the smoke guy, you know, just, you know, right. it's just so, you know what I mean? And I'm not dogging that, but you know what I mean? Like, like you said, that band was not impressive to you, the yeah. first band at Calvary, right. but yet there was an anointing on yeah. it that you go, like, like kind of like the first Corinthians 14, where he says, you know, you prophesy and people's hearts are revealed and they'll say, surely God is in your midst. And that's what I think right. we need more of, where people go, it isn't love songs, so killing it, but it's love mm-hmm. song with sincere people mm-hmm. saying God worked through us and where people are going, my goodness. And they leave kind of praising God more yeah. than praising love song or these exactly. cool hippies, you know. So. Yeah. Well, you know, one of my my points of when we achieved in love song, when we achieved the greatest ending of our concert was when it ended without applause. We do a worship song. Mm. In my solo concerts, I'd just walk off stage in the middle of it. We'd start singing the hallelujah or something, and then I'd walk off and they'd finish it. Everybody would fall out in reverence, you know. But I I would make this observation in some of my seminars I've done in the past. I haven't done it in a long time. But uh, not so much today because musical excellence is there today. But we didn't have that, say, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, bands were good, but we didn't have the technology to make the records they did. We didn't have the budget. But I always observe, you know, we, we, what, what we don't have in our music, that worldly music, and we don't have the sexual element like the Tina Turner. We can't do that. <laughs> and we're usually not as good a musician. Yeah. So what do we have they don't have? We only have one thing, the anointing. And if you don't go for that, then you're just going to be a band that's not that good. Yeah. So I, I always try to encourage young musicians, you know, it's not about how good you are. It's how good your heart is and how connected you are to God and out of the heart. Uh, abundance of the heart the mouth will speak that kind of thing because i think that's square one for a young musician because now they see all this flash yeah now the model is you know hillsong and all that yeah but uh and they want to achieve that and sometimes i'll just tell them that's not the goal yeah. you know yeah. just stand up there with your guitar what another thing i get is somebody to write a song and they'll send it to me to critique i hate it's one of the things i hate most <laughs> in the world and uh, it'll usually be junky, and but I'll say, look, God, I know what it means to them. God gave them their song. And I say, you know, this may, are you trying to be Michael W. Smith? Because this probably won't get you there. But if you realize that God gave you this song, maybe just for yourself, maybe just for your home group, maybe just for your church. So, like, bloom where you're planted and don't try to achieve something outside of your, you know, what God's called you to do. And you may not be called to a big, big music ministry. You may not be called to ever be in a Hillsong type band. So I, a part of it, it sounds funny, but part of encouraging people is to give them, uh, what is it Chuck always used to say? Uh, he who expects nothing is never disappointed. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> yeah, so I always tell them, you know, yeah. not to set a low goal, but don't bring it back yeah. to reality. Yeah, you're not yeah, gonna, exactly. No. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I love that because that's how it was for my brother and I. We both lead worship at our church and we 
we kind of were like put in the positions. Like we didn't ask for we it. We didn't, worship. we didn't grow up as <laughs> worship. You. You're my we, kids. we literally were like, there's, there's people on the worship team that were like sleeping together. And so then they got exposed. And then my dad's like, you're not on the worship team anymore. And then it was kind of like, well, here's the pastor's kids learn this. And so it was cool because it was something where it wasn't like we were just even, I guess would have been naturally gifted, but it was something we, we're able to fill in and and then it's cool because so many times I'm like well comp- when we compare ourselves to other people well the bible says you're foolish but compare ourselves it's like oh we're not even even close to right. these other things but when people like they will tell us like they're my brother and his wife they write songs and she just wrote a song called to you and people are just weeping and just mm-hmm. overwhelmed by the presence of god and that's what is so cool cuz our team is just nothing special, just really simple. And yet people are saying like, I'm just like crying in worship and overwhelmed and there's nothing to like this hype it up yeah. even. Yeah. But that's where I'm just thankful that you had mentioned that because I think we're all striving for the Hill song and the Bethel. But <laughs> it's so wrong because when you think about it, it's all for self, like to be seen. And people always ask my brother and I like, in worship, why do you guys always like close your eyes or just look up? And I'm like, Cause we're worshiping God. Like Mm -hmm. we go to these other churches and they're like pointing at the people and like, (laughs) like it's not about that. And so I think that that's just encouragement for people out there who feel like, Oh man, I, I can't get a crowd really going. And it's, it's not about that. It's about like the person who you're leading worship, but you're also directing them to God. Like you're pointing them to intimacy with him. So I like, I I, I, I I always, sorry. I always, when I, when I share in worship, I tell people, you're not a worship leader, you're a worship priest. That's good. You stand yeah, in the gap That's between good. God and man, yeah. and your job is to bring the will of God down mm. and get the people to worship Amen. and then bring that, create that circle. Mm-hmm. So that should always be your goal, uh, Mariah. That, I, that, that's right, Mariah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Always be your, let the, you'll never go wrong if that's your goal, because you want to bring the Lord to them, and it doesn't matter what a great musician or not that you are. It's, it matters your heart, you know. I want to I want to yeah. say this, Chuck, and I don't know if you can relate to this at all. I wasn't when I got saved in '81. I didn't know love songs, so I to me, so I went from yeah, I went from, I went from ACDC, you know, Highway to Hell. I was kind of I was kind of like like I said, a biker hippie, like the hard, really hardcore stuff, and and uh, you know Molly Hatchet and all that. But it's like, um, so then rock and roll to me, I was brought to, to um, Amy Grant. I want to stand on a mountaintop, and I'm like, whoa, you. wait a sec, this is this is kind of a big, too big a shit for me. And I that I thought about uh, what is it, Resurrection Band. But anyway, so I remember, and uh, I guess and you had talked about this, so maybe you want to talk about this. But it's Keith Green, that's who I yeah. got turned on to. But I remember going, this isn't sexy. This music is so not what I'm into, but yet I loved so it because the words. And so I mean, if I'd heard love song, I would love that too. I love Little Country Church. I really dig that one. Yeah. You know, suits and ties, long hairs. You know. But it's like, but the music wasn't even as hardcore mm-hmm. as the world, but yet was, like you said, anointing yeah. because I kind of mm-hmm. listen to Keith now and I go, it's kind of almost a little nerdy at times, you know, too. but yet it was so powerful. Yeah. And uh, maybe you, cause you, you kind of yeah, helped that. start, I forget the story, like you knew Keith before That's he was he Keith. Said, mm-hmm. When so he was 13 share. and right, you said you, and I think it was in, with your daughter, you're talking about how. You did like six songs with him. You sang back up. And then, but can you tell us though how later when Keith was saved, how did you reconnect with him and how did, um, he, and just for those who don't know Keith Green, maybe explain like who he is because we love him. We still to this day sing his songs and love all his songs. Um, the No Compromise, we love all his album, all that, basically all his songs because they're also what I love about them. Um, he says, if you can't come to me, one part says, if you can't come to me every day, then don't bother coming <laughs> yeah, at all. I'm like, intense. you don't hear that nowadays. Like, Keith's stuff no, is really trouble with that. intense and we love one of it. My but... favorite, one of my favorite lines is, uh, how can you be so dead when you're so yeah, well fed? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that yeah. one too. Or I love this as a good hippie, right? You know, uh, Jesus rose from the dead and you can't even get, get out, out of bed. bed. I'm like, oh, you know, because I, I still have that hippie ways. I tend to be a late night guy, you know, so I still don't do the early as well as I should. I've done it. I've tried, but I just decide, hey, I'm more of, I, I do better at night yeah. seeking God than early morning. So, 
But uh, anyway, Keith always convicted you're, me. On you're, that. you're a night guy, sure. Yeah. You're I'm a night weird guy. guy, yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't know how you were as a hippie, but I mean, I would wake up at like th- <laughs> two, three in the afternoon and then party all night and then go to bed around six, seven, depending on how good the party was. One, so, yeah, so. one of the great musicians' joke is I uh, get up every day at the crack of noon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's good. That's good. Ken Gullickson, who founded the vineyard, was a friend of my wife's before I met my wife, and um, I knew him through Calvary. We had moved to the valley, and he called us up one day, and he said, I want to start a a Bible study in the valley, but I don't know anybody. Can I use your house? So we started a meeting at our house in uh, Sun Valley, California, and um, there wasn't much activity at first. You know, it was people, different people come in every week, and there was only six to ten, and a little discouraging at first. Mm. And we'd often pray, you know, we'd say, like, are we supposed to keep this going or not? Well, we felt we should, and then uh, uh, he, he started studies in other people's homes. Larry Norman was one of the first mm. Bible studies in his home as well. And uh, Ken's goal was to form a church up in the valley. So once we got enough people accumulated from those home meetings, um, he put a roof on it. And we found some, I think it was a woman's club. I, he, Thank God he... Ken is writing his book right now. Ken is in very poor health. And yeah. the guy that helped Lonnie with his books, uh, Roger Sachs, is helping Ken get his story written. And I'm so glad because yeah. that story needs to be yeah, told. Yeah, I really want to have him too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you have, might have a hard time. He's real frail. Yeah, I saw, I saw him do the Lonnie thing, one of the books mm-hmm. a couple years ago or I don't know how long ago. And he looked, yeah, he, he really had a hard time walking even. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's pretty infirm. Yeah. So anyhow... Um, we we started we put a roof on it and um, I started eventually we wound up finally in a fairly um, uh, regular place it was St Paul's Methodist in 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 Tarzana I think and um, I I'd go to church and people say hey this guy named Keith Green got saved and says he knows you well Keith was thirteen uh, I didn't tell the story earlier I did but are you going to use that with the yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, you can share it yeah, bad yeah. vocal yeah. Okay, well, back in the my, my experience with Keith Green Star, I like to tell the story without people knowing who it is because it's more of yeah, an impact, yeah. you know. Because you say, well, there was this young kid that <laughs> uh, I worked for doing background for a, rec- a record producer in Hollywood, and he had this young client, and he was a guitar a piano virtuoso and had written these great songs, and uh, so I was in that crew that sang behind his records. We do the ooh ah parts, you know. And uh, that was it. Six six sessions. I mean, six singles out of however many sessions, and never saw him again. So I, they're telling me now, ten years later, this guy named Keith Green remembers you. And I thought, well, is that that little kid? You know. And then I realized, well, he'd be 23 now or 24. So finally, we connected. And uh, you know, he wasn't famous yet. And so I said to him, you know, like I, I was pretty well known at this time. And I said, you know, if I have a booking that I can't fill, I'll give me your phone number and I'll tell him to call you and you can have that gig or that service. And uh, sometimes a couple of times he opened for me. And uh, that was my connection to him in those early days. And of course, then he began to be a regular at the vineyard. So I'd see him there. But I never really became real close to him. I never went over to his home or anything. He was a little off-putting, to be honest. You know, he was so He's really intense. Un- intense, yeah, and a little bit judgmental yeah. in yeah. those days. So it was sort of like you see Keith coming, you kind of you don't want to get, <laughs> get spanked. You know, I always laughed about his records. To be completely candid, I'd say, man, he's known so many records. People are lining up. And paying six dollars to get their spanking from Keith. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's why he did the free ones because yeah. he was a little, yeah. a little too much. Yeah, Keith. Oh, I, that's know, what that, I was. That, I was. He, who was it? It was. Um, I can't remember the guy's. Um, Camp. Uh, Jeremy Camp was saying he's friends with Keith, and he said that one day Keith he was calling Keith and said, "Yeah, man, pray for me. I just got mugged right outside of my concert." And Keith goes, "So." Are you all right? He goes, yeah. And he goes, well, did you witness to him? And he's going, bro, I just got mugged, you know. And he said Keith was judging him, you know, like he said, pretty intense, saying, did you witness to him, you know. And so and he said, well, he goes, you either loved Keith or hated him. It was kind of, you weren't very indifferent to him. I mean, Jeremy he was pretty, Camp, was he that? I think he's too young. Or was not Jeremy. Too? Not Jeremy. Who, which one? Uh, Steve Camp. Steve Camp. Okay. Sorry. Steve, Steve Camp. Camp yeah. Steve Camp. Jeremy Camp. Sorry. Good but catch there, Mariah. I get it. I like, good I catch. Yeah. But, I tried yeah, to catch so him before, Steve and I was Camp, wrong. I don't even remember Steve, but Steve was saying that. 
you know, because I he met me, I talked, and I kind of can be pretty intense sometimes. Mm. And he says, "Yeah, he goes, you and Keith probably because I was getting ready right before he died. I was getting ready to go to Last Days Ministries to help. I was a I was a construction guy, so I was going to build their kind of their dorms for their school and uh, for the people. And so he had just died right like the week before I was getting ready to go. So it was pretty weird. Mm. Um, so yeah. d- so can I so with Ken." Because he was called the pastor of love. Like, he's mm. real mellow, real. Like, mm. he is so, you know, not Keith Green, right? <laughs> and he, so did, well, he was with Calvary, right? I mean, he was with mm. Calvary Chapel. So he kind of, right. did he break off, like we were saying off camera? Did he start Did he break or? off because he wanted a little more of the gifts? What was the, why did he not just start at Calvary, mm. in your opinion? Yeah, um, he. I think he just wanted to do something that had a different profile and more more uh, freedom of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. I don't know why he didn't become a Calvary. That's actually a question I never asked him or had answered. But um, I know that they struggled for a long time about the, the the name of the church. In fact, the name of his book is going to be called "Call It the Vineyard" mm-hmm. because the Lord spoke to him in the middle of the night and told him this whole thing about you know call it the vineyard for this reason or that. Uh, so that was, you know, that became the name of the church. But we, as we started off, it wasn't really, we didn't even have a name. Wow. Yeah. So, and what's really wild now know. is how you associate, at least I do, John Wimber yeah. with the, I thought John Wimber, Sorry. like I, I knew Ken had started it, but now kind of John, right, said, I just want to be a part. And then it's sort of now most people synonymous vineyard is yeah. John Wimber right. when it's really Ken Gullickson. Yeah. Crazy. Well, how that happened was uh, John had Ken and John had connected. Uh, Ken, Ken and uh, yeah, John had connected, and John became a father figure to Ken, speaking into his life. Oh. But he was still at Calvary Chapel Yorba Linda, mm. and then Lonnie Frisbee was in Florida, and he came back to the California. And of course, the Calvaries didn't want anything to do with Lonnie, so in general, but John did, and he said, "I'll give you a meeting." Mm. And so Lonnie had this. I, were you telling me about punching people in the stomach and all that, no, or no. doing weird things? No, but he, yeah, he. I heard like people yeah. on the on the thing. Where they said he had his little. Remember, you probably remember his deer skin. <laughs> remember the the anointing. You throw it on people and they go mm-hmm. out. And that's, oh, can I ask you this? I gotta ask. I just get off point, but let's go back to this. But I want to ask you this. So this is what I always think like with Chuck. We were talking about how Chuck was sort of the protective parent. Lonnie was the crazy <laughs> hippie. Mm-hmm. They'd say anything fly. But it was funny to me because I argue with a lot of Calvary guys about going, you know, slaying the spirit, going out in the power because I've experienced that. But it was funny. I mm-hmm. heard from people that Chuck would literally say, don't do that. And I'm going, well, if it's really the Lord, how could you say don't do You know, I'm going, now yeah. if you're pushing people, you do see the people that do the head yeah. thing, you know, you go, stop. Yeah. But I've prayed for people before, not much, but where I've just prayed and they've just fall. And I'm like, now you don't know if they're just used to that. Maybe they're yeah. assembly or something. But you can't, I mean, if it's God, how could you say, don't do that? So can you unpack, like, what, what's your, what's your take on that? Yeah. Because he kind of, I mean, I heard people say, Chuck would say, stop doing it. And I didn't ever talk to Chuck mm-hmm. about it. But was, I'm going, well, was it because he was hitting people? Or was it truly because, I mean, from what mm-hmm. little I hear of the Mother's Day thing of Vineyard, mm-hmm. it was, he goes, oh, he was all scared of Lonnie. He'd heard the things. And then he goes, oh, he's just so funny. This is great. And then he said, Hey, we've hurt. We've been hurting the Holy Spirit or grieving Him, but He's over it, and He really wants to move. And He says, "Come, Holy Spirit!" And then, like, people were falling all over the place. And then someone fell by the mic and started cracking out in tongues. And and He said, "People are like running for the door." And you know, something. I guess the younger people loved it, but the older people were like, "Whoa, this is terrible." And so, yeah, right. So I want to. So what? Since you were there around that time, what? How do you unpack that? I mean, is was it made up or was it God or? It was a little of both, or yeah. but I mean, because I'm saying I don't understand how Pastor Chuck could say, "Stop right. knocking people over." If God's doing it now, if He's hitting people, then mm-hmm. I'd say not cool. Because I had someone try to do, it and I said, "Hit me one more time, I'm gonna hit you back." Stop <laughs> it. But I've also there's a few times I've gone out where I've gone, "Whoa!" And I didn't have to, but I just felt like, "Hey, this is kind of mm-hmm. cool." And and a lot of my Calvary brothers, you know, pastors think I'm a nut for even <laughs> embracing, even being open to that. But like I said, I'm kind of. You know, I kind of feel like I'm trying to be in between of Vineyard, Calvary, solid word, but yet, uh, you sure. know, uh, the word, spirit and spirit word and truth yeah. and spirit and truth, you know, that we want both, not just one or. No. So what say you? I'm sorry, I didn't well, mean Well, my, my little joke is I've resisted the best Pentecostal massages. In the <laughs> 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 yeah. 
I'd let them back me up to the wall. Yeah. Here's my take on that. You know, I, I, of course, I believe in all the gifts, and I've mm-hmm. operated in a few myself. I've, I've never considered that considered that to be my major calling. I've had some words of knowledge and some s- specific stuff that happened. But uh, what I think happens is people people like to repeat something that is real. Mm-hmm. You know, so. Let, you know, let's say one night I w- I've been s- slain in the spirit twice, mm. both under the same ministry and both times they never touched me. Mm. My wife went down. My wife does not fall mm. for, you know, yeah, it was God <laughs> can't make my, unless it's God. Yeah. And it was in a Catherine Coleman meeting. Oh, wow. And uh, it's kind of a cute story. I'll, I'll tell you that real quick. Uh, we're all, all Catherine Coleman used to have us down at the Palladium, and she'd put us on bleachers, sort of give her street cred, you know, I have the hippies, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, my wife is not public. She's off to the side. Lonnie says, Karen, you got to get on the stage with us. So he goes over and gets my wife, and he pulls her right on the stage. There's only one chair. It's right in the middle in the front seat, not where she wants, in the front row, she, on the stage, not where she wants to be. <laughs> so she's sitting there, and it happens to be Catherine's seat. And Catherine was getting up to uh, introduce Jimmy McDonald, was the singer that used to mm-hmm. sing for her. Uh, her events so she finishes introducing the singer and she comes back and they share a seat now my wife's sitting right next to Catherine Coleman on oh, wow. the same seat till till the song's over so when the song's over Catherine gets up and she walks about 12 feet t- to get to the mic and before she gets to the mic she just turns and she says come here dear <laughs> and my wife gets up and face plants and she's drunk in the spirit for like eight hours and I'm just I mean that does not happen to my wife yeah so my answer would be that, you know, people, they want to repeat something. And that's what we start to do is we make a sort of a liturgy out of it. You mm-hmm. know, let's make a stupid example up. You know, we, we sang um, uh, uh, Our God Reigns and then so-and-so prayed and then this guy spoke. Mm-hmm. And so they then somebody fell down. Recreate that. Yeah. Recreate it. Yeah. So the, the first time it's by the Spirit, that we're, the Spirit is making us do what he wants. The second time we're trying to get the Spirit mm-hmm. to do what we want. Mm-hmm. It's just, that, that principle. So that happens on a large scale. Then you get into an official thing where it becomes a part of someone's ministry and you have modesty cloths and catchers. My philosophy is if you're really slain in the spirit, nobody has to be behind you because not, God's not going to let you get hurt. Yeah, yeah, exactly. so, so there's a lot of that stuff that becomes sort of a, a, a you know, bandwagon and people get into you know, Benny Hinn yeah. blowing and all that stuff. So yeah. Um, I, I, I'm a total believer in all of that yeah, stuff, but, um, I and I told God, I said, if you want to lift the building up and spin it around, if you, <laughs> I've taken people out, I've done Jericho marches around churches yeah, yeah. with all the people, exactly. um, uh, but it has to be God. It's kind of crazy how we're kind of a resistant as Calvary to that stuff, but really Catherine was kind of a big part of the early days of mm-hmm. Calvary and Lonnie, right? She prayed for Lonnie for that anointing to be upon. Mm-hmm. So it's like. We got to, you know, like you said, we want to be charismatic with a seatbelt. We want to be open to whatever is God, Amen. but we don't want to recreate mm-hmm. and just try to, you know, like you said, do the wacky mm-hmm. in the head business. But if it's God, how can we say no to it? And to say what you were saying, how um, from what I heard from Chuck, it was here in Tucson where when Chuck was four square that a guy, I forget the, the name of the, what it, Maranatha, if you remember Maranatha movement, but they came down mm-hmm. and they... I forget the guy's name, probably is important, but he came down and he says, we've got to do all these gimmicks to get people. Remember to get, like, if you get so many people, you go to run a trip to Hawaii. And so Chuck had one of his kids in his arms. So he said, everyone agrees, stand up. And so it was here in Tucson where he just sat down and then the guy goes, rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. He told him and he said, that's it, I'm out of here. You know, that's why I think probably, I don't know if you agree, but that's where Chuck gets that caution because he saw the abuses yeah of the extreme charismatic movement. So he was spirit filled, open to the spirit, but yet I always like, say charismatic with a seatbelt, right? We don't mm-hmm. want to... That came out of his experience with Foursquare. You know, I love Foursquare. I went to a four, Jack Hayford for 12 years, but uh, he was always, like I say, overprotective about, about letting wildfire break out. And he called his, I think he had a book called Charismania. Yeah. So, charisma so back... versus charisma, charisma versus charismania. Yeah. 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 So back to that subject, though, uh, two things. First of all, the media got involved, and we had people from all the networks coming down to do, uh, you know, filming for a documentary that'd be on the TV next, uh, you know, network TV the next week, and uh, stuff like that was happening left and right. But Chuck's overprotectiveness, as I see it, and I don't say that really 
uh, as a dig to him. I mean, I, it was part of what it was part of what how God used him to keep the balance, you know. But he really didn't let that stuff happen in meetings. Yeah. I saw a guy stand up one time, and he was giving a word right while Chuck was speaking, and Chuck uh, kind of shut him down. He says, "Sir, the Holy Spirit does not contradict Himself. Please sit down." Well, the guy walked out, you know, because he was upset about that, but. That's how Chuck was. And so what really, in my opinion, two things brought the Holy Spirit to Calvary Chapel. And now the movement, to just jump ahead a little bit, is a bit Baptocostal. Mm. But back in those days, the balance came from the fact that Lonnie was really letting the Holy Spirit breathe. But then Chuck would keep the reins on. Like I like that. Uh, what did you call it with a seatbelt? <laughs> yeah, charismatic with a seatbelt. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's a great. I'm going to use that. Yeah, that's cool. And uh so that was kind of the atmosphere, you know, and, and then, of course, if you if you went there every, you know, as we did, uh, any, any night the door was open, we were there. We lived communally as hippies for a while, and then we ha- had a couple in the church that gave us a, they, they were empty nesters, and they had some empty bedrooms, and they said, how are you guys doing financially? And, well, you know, we're getting paid 25 bucks a gig, yeah. you know, paying most of our gas out. <laughs> but, <laughs> He said, well, we have some empty rooms and we'll kind of, we'll we'll be your parents, you know, and let you guys go minister. And it it was really cool. In those days, um, we all lived in that house and and we were on call for Chuck. He'd call us up at five o'clock and he'd say, boys, be ready in an hour. I got a meeting out in Riverside. We're going to go minister. So we'd just grab our guitars. In those days, we didn't, in those days, we didn't even really have the drum thing going yet. So we'd just bring our guitars and maybe a bass and we'd sing for Chuck's meetings on the on the spot. So we were always ministering with him in that regard. But uh, it always bothered me a little bit that it wasn't didn't allow a little more movement of the Holy Spirit. And that's really where the vineyard came in. Yeah. Yeah. And Gullickson was a, a was a, 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 a Calvary pastor. And he wanted to start something that gave a little more place to the Holy Spirit. So we had already moved up to the valley. So he, uh, about an hour away, San Fernando Valley. And um, he called us up one day and he said, I want to start a Bible study. Can I use your living room? So that's how the vineyard thing started. But it was, um, and that became a little, you know, Ken was still very sweet and soft, but he wanted the Holy Spirit to move more. So with you said how Chuck was sort of the protective parent. So do you think without Dog and Chuck, because we all love Pastor Chuck, Mm -hmm. but do you think he kind of sometimes resisted that just because he just didn't like the Definitely. appearance so he, so there was times there was truly people going under the power i like to say going under the power because who wants to get slain but yeah. where the power hits you and you just kind of go but where he said i'm I not never digging. personally saw that at calvary mm-hmm. i never saw any that happen. oh you never did because someone was never talking did. the hippie remember the hippie preacher movie they were saying so one of his friends were saying he would throw his little deer skin. I don't know if you ever saw that, but he'd throw Lonnie it on would. like Lonnie would, and he'd throw it on people and say, "Receive the anointing." And and so mm-hmm. people would fall. Supposedly, I think it was on Wednesday nights. Well, or... might have been. Uh, I never was in a meeting where I like I say I saw an exorcism Lonnie did. <laughs> so that's pretty radical. Yeah, yeah. But I I didn't know about the deer skin until right now or any of that stuff. Oh, wow. so, so do you believe yeah. as a Calvary but, guy, or I don't know if you still call you, mm-hmm. but do you believe? Because yeah, this is a big this is a big thing where I get shredded. Is for believing you can go under the power of slaying the spirit, whatever you want to call it. That that's a big no no, at least in my area. And then also a huge thing. And if you've done drugs, I came to Christ. I had a lot of oppression, not yeah. possession, but oppress, mm-hmm. yeah. because I would see faces, I'd hear voices, yeah. and so this guy—I don't know if you've heard of a guy named Tom White. He wrote a, a book called mm-hmm. "Guide to Spiritual Warfare," but he um, was a Baptist like me in my church in Oregon, Corvallis, and he got uh, saw he was he had been in witchcraft and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So he's seeing faces. Well, then he realized, wait a sec, I have authority over this in Christ. I don't have yeah. to take this. And then he started doing deliverance. But here's the key, right? Even Calvary would have a problem. But he he would pray for Christians that had oppression, especially people like me had gone through the LSD, yes. as you know, pharmacia, the uh, a sorcery of pharmacia, opens where it opens door. you, I believe, mm-hmm. to a lot of. So I'm I'm just thinking I'm I'm having flashbacks. I'm schizophrenic, and then all of a sudden this crazy guy is now he's in a barn out in the middle of nowhere or something, and I might go into a cult. Mm-hmm. And this guy says, what do you have to lose? He prays for me, and I'm totally set free. I've been yep. saved two years. Mm-hmm. So I'm going, and I and I tell Calvary Pastor, and they go, well, you, it was probably a power suggestion. I go, mm-hmm. I was a Baptist. I didn't believe in this stuff. I just went because I was seeing faces, demons looking at me, hearing voices, and he prayed for me and gone. Yeah. And so 
yeah. once I was blind, but now. So I said, guys, you can tell me whatever you want, but I was there. I saw it. I sure. felt the experience. I, I, I'm a total. I wouldn't probably be here today if I had had if God had used that person to set me free from demonic oppression, not possession, yeah. but oppression. So yeah. you, you kind of, you, you're. You're cool with that? I, mean, I went pressure. through it. I had, I had a, a lot of darkness on me and heaviness in my first year or two, maybe more, as a Christian. It's kind of what got me back into alcohol. Thank you so much for joining us on Calvary Conversations. If you haven't already, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video. If you like to listen to us, wherever you get your podcasts, just type in Calvary Conversations. You can also follow us on Instagram at Calvary Conversations. Please check out our sponsors, Mission Heating and Cooling. You can find them in the description below. Also, please watch our part two with Chuck Gerard. Thanks so much, guys, and God bless.